it's really become my view that we could well be on the leading edge of just a massive disruption that I think is going to put just a terrific amount of stress on society and also on the economy. And the central idea here, of course, is that smart machines and algorithms and robots are increasingly going to substitute for workers, and they're going to take over more and more of the work that is now being done by human beings. Now, I've been thinking about this for five or six years, and during that time, I've had a chance to talk to a lot of technical people that are deeply engaged in these technologies, people doing research in areas like artificial intelligence or robotics. And I found that, that a very large percentage of those people generally share my concern that we're headed for this disruption. So there is something of a, an emerging consensus, you might call it, on, on the technical side that we're, we're headed for something that's entirely different. On the other hand, there is also a, a lot of skepticism out there. And I think that as a group, it's probably fair to say that economists tend to be fairly skeptical of this. The skepticism is, is sort of anchored in, in history. Uh, it turns out that this idea that machines would displace workers is definitely not new. It goes back at a minimum 200 years to the Luddite revolts. Uh, this fear, this concern has been raised again and again, but it's always turned out to be a false concern. Um, so I think that there is quite a bit uh, in common with, with that old story of the little boy who cries wolf. The alarm is raised again and again. It doesn't happen. People become complacent. But it's important to remember that in the end uh, of that story, the wolf does show up. And I think that <laughs> could be where we're headed this time. Again, I believe that this time is different. So let me begin by just reviewing what I think is different this time. What's different about today's te te technology versus the things we've seen in the past. And I point to, to three things that I really think sets uh, today's information technology apart. The first thing, of course, is that we've got this exponential acceleration going on. And most people have heard of Moore's Law, I think, uh, which basically says that computing power has been doubling every two years or so. But it's actually much broader than that. It extends to software in many cases. It extends to <coughs> communications bandwidth and so forth. So we're seeing this, this very broad-based acceleration. And that acceleration has been going on for a long time. It's been going on, in fact, for decades. And when you keep doubling something again and again for decades, I mean, you end up with really a, an extraordinary amount of absolute progress. Things are moving at a, at a very fast rate. And that's the reason that uh, things, I think, are going to unfold in a, at a rate that is really quite surprising as we, as we go forward. Uh, the second thing I would point to is that machines are now taking on cognitive capability. Machines, in a limited sense, are beginning to think. And this means that they're really starting to encroach on, on the fundamental quality that really sets us apart as a species, the thing that, that sort of defines people and, and that so far has allowed us to keep ahead of the march of technology. It's our ability to adapt, to learn, and, and, to, uh, and to think. And uh, machines are, are in a limited capacity moving into that area now. You know, you've now got smart algorithms that can make decisions that can solve problems, and most importantly, that can learn. You know, the central technology here is probably machine learning, and that's all about algorithms that can churn through data, and based on that, they can learn and they can make predictions. And um, that sort of implies that an extraordinary number of jobs are ultimately going to be threatened by this. One way to sort of think about it is to ask yourself, could a particular job be done by another smart person if that person had access to a detailed record of everything that's been done in the past? If the answer to that is yes, then it's a good bet that eventually a smart algorithm or a machine will come along and also be able to follow that same technique. So that, when you really sit down and think of it, that gives you an idea that there's really a very large number of jobs out there that could be impacted by this. And, and the third thing that's really different is that information technology is a general purpose technology. It's now ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It invades every sector of the economy, every business, every organization. There isn't any safe haven for workers out there. Um, and that's quite different from what we've seen in the past, where, for example, uh, farm machinery transformed agriculture. And that did create a lot of unemployment, but it was only one sector of the economy. And those other sectors absorbed the workers that lost their jobs on farms. But now we're seeing a technology that really is going to hit across the board. And so that's what's different. Now, when you put these three things together, I think what you end up is really something that looks like a utility almost. It's almost like electricity. But instead of just delivering electric power, it actually delivers machine intelligence. So you've got this broad-based utility that's just going to scale across the whole economy. And one implication of that is going to make uh, everything less labor-intensive. There's going to be less need for human labor, especially 
uh, the kind of labor that is done by what we might think of as average people with average capability and average educations and skill levels. So going forward, I think that that could be quite disruptive. Another very important point that people who are a little bit skeptical about this will make is that there is this ongoing process of creative destruction. And what that means is that old things get destroyed and new things get created. So we know that, that technology may upend many of the industries that we have today, but we also know that new industries will certainly be created in the future, and of course those industries will have to hire people. So a skeptic might say, doesn't that imply that, that lots of new opportunities are going to be created in the future? And we can think of what some of those new industries will be, things like nanotechnology and virtual reality and synthetic biology and so forth. And those definitely will exist, but what I'm showing here on this slide is that there are good reasons to believe that those new industries, although they will come into being, are simply not going to hire many people. They won't have much need for human labor, and, and the reason is that they will utilize all of this powerful technology right from their inception. Um, so what you see here is a comparison of General Motors, which in 1979 had jobs for about 840,000 people. And that compares with Google in 2012 that had less than 5% of that number. And yet, Google actually generated, in inflation-adjusted terms, 20% more in terms of earnings. So Google is actually a more profitable company than General Motors ever was. So this is just an example of the kind of leverage that companies are now able to get from this technology. And, and the point here is that as we go forward over the next couple of decades, I think that the entire economy is going to come to look more like Google and less like General Motors. And that implies fewer opportunities for, for human workers. What I'm showing here is the same kind of idea from a different perspective. This is also about creative destruction, but here I'm talking about occupations. Very often you'll hear people say that, you know, 50 or 100 years ago, people would have never been able to imagine all these new jobs that we have today. And that's absolutely true, things like website designers and social media marketers and data scientists and so forth are all occupations that people even a couple of decades ago would have never foreseen. However, what I'm showing here is that those new jobs, while they exist, they're really a tiny percentage of our employment. It turns out that in the United States, about 90% of workers are in occupations that existed 100 years ago. It's traditional things like driving vehicles, working in offices, doing relatively routine clerical things factories and, and, and so forth. These are all traditional occupations, and I think it's easy to foresee that over the next couple of decades, a lot of those occupations are going to be disrupted by this. A lot of them are going to be threatened by automation, and there certainly will be new roles that will appear, but it, it's kind of difficult to believe that there are going to be enough of those new opportunities to really absorb all the impacted workers in more traditional areas. And there's also likely to be a skill mismatch. Uh, a lot of the new things being created really require a high level of education or a skill or capability in a, in a particular technical area and so forth. So it will probably be very difficult for many average people to move into those roles, even if there are sufficient openings. So I think that, again, this, this really points to a coming disruption that we need to start thinking about. So let me just show you a couple graphs from the United States that I think provide some evidence of what's happening here. What you see here is a comparison of hourly compensation for average workers in the United States versus productivity. And productivity is essentially the value of what we produce divided by the number of hours it takes to produce it. And if you pick up any economics textbook, it will tell you that things are supposed to work the way the first half of this graph works, where you see these two lines tightly correlated. What you see there is that productivity increases because of technological progress, and then wages also increase in lockstep with that. The idea is that machines are tools, the tools become better, workers then are able to produce more, and they become more valuable. And as a result of that, they ought to be able to command a higher income. And that's exactly what happened in the United States from the end of World War II up until the mid-1970s. But then something interesting happened, and you see that these two lines basically decouple. Wages are now flat. Uh, we haven't seen any growth at all in incomes, but productivity continued its climb. So we've got this opening gap between these two lines. And essentially what they're saying is that now all the fruits of innovation, of all this progress, are, are being captured by the people that own businesses, basically. Business owners and investors and executives, people like that. And, and average workers are really not getting any of it. And I think that part of the reason that uh, this is happening is that, that we're seeing the nature of machines change. During, during this period when these lines were move, moving together in lockstep, 
machines were essentially tools. Machines were things that made workers more valuable. But we are now going through a transition where, where machines are going from being tools to actually becoming workers. They're becoming autonomous and actually in many cases replacing that worker. And so instead of making a worker more valuable, they're actually in some cases making that worker less valuable. And that, I think, is one of the important things that's driving this gap that we see opening up here. This shows uh, what job creation looks like in the United States by decade. If you go back to the 1960s and look at every subsequent decade, you can see that it looks almost like a declining staircase. Each decade, with the exception of the 1990s, produced fewer jobs in percentage terms than the previous decade. So again, this is an indication that there is some kind of a structural shift happening. Something is happening that's basically making the economy less effective at creating jobs. And you can see this last decade, uh, the first decade of this century was just a total disaster for job creation, where there weren't any new jobs at all created. And that's largely because of the financial crisis that we had. But if you look at the last visible bar here, that's showing the percentage job creation just through 2007, about the time that the financial crisis started. And you can see that it already didn't look very good. So in other words, even if the financial crisis hadn't occurred, this pattern would have held. You know, we still would have had a relatively weak uh, job creation. So again, I think this is an indication that some kind of a fundamental shift is happening in our, our economy. Another important point, which is really important for, for people to understand, is that the conventional view we have about the kinds of jobs that are impacted by automation is really not quite correct. The traditional view has always been that technology and automation primarily impact low-skilled work. It's going to come after blue-collar workers, people that don't have a lot of education, people doing you know, manipulative type work, people standing on an assembly line in factories or working in a warehouse, things like that. As a result of that, the solution that's always been proposed is, is education. Education is really the only conventional solution we have to this kind of impact. Uh, the idea is that when workers lose their low-skilled jobs, we send them back to school, we send them for some more training, they are then able to climb the skills ladder and take on a more you know, sophisticated role. Um, so perhaps the, the worker that loses their job in a warehouse may find a, a new job in, in an office where they're using their brain more, where they have a high, higher skill level, they have a better work environment, and then generally they should be better off. What this shows is that the problem with that is that technology is now also climbing that skills ladder. And we're seeing a big impact on white collar jobs, including many of the kinds of jobs that university graduates take. This slide shows an article from the Wall Street Journal recently, and it's talking about the corporate finance departments in large corporations, and it turns out that the number of people in those departments in big corporations relative to the revenue of those companies has collapsed by about 40% in the last decade. So almost half of those jobs have evaporated, and it's all happened because of smart software that's increasingly taking on those roles. Uh, and we see this in many other areas as well. In journalism, there are now algorithms that can generate news stories automatically. Legal document review is being automated. Um, some areas of medicine like radiology are very susceptible to this. So the point is that increasingly we're seeing an impact on the kinds of skilled jobs that, that university graduates take. And that really you know, has implications for the future, especially in terms of that traditional solution to all of this. Uh, a second important thing is that all of this ultimately is going to have an, imp an, an economic impact. You know, it's not just about the impact on individuals and on, and on families and on society. Of course, that's critically important, but there also is an economic impact from this because we need to have consumers. We need to have people who are capable of buying the products and services that are created by the economy. Without that, we run the risk of getting into stagnation or even a kind of downward spiral where there simply aren't enough viable customers out there for businesses to sell to. And if that turns out to be the case, then you really get into kind of an, a deflationary scenario. And I think you see some evidence of that already. But you, know, you, you can think of this in, in terms of the drive to inequality that, that we already see. Uh, think in terms of a billionaire, someone like Bill Gates. In theory, he's got an infinite amount of purchasing power. He can go out and buy anything. But the reality, he's not going to do that He's not going to buy a thousand cars. He's not going to buy a thousand smartphones. He's definitely not going to sit down and eat a thousand restaurant meals. So when you take purchasing power from a thousand average people and concentrate that all into the hands of one very wealthy person, you, you take a lot of demand out of the economy. You know, there, there are fewer viable customers out of there. I mean, that, that really runs the risk of getting into that kind of a deflationary scenario.
Um, this shows some evidence that, that this is perhaps already becoming an issue. This is a graph of retail sales in the United States versus corporate profits uh, since the recovery from the Great Recession. And you can see that corporate profits have been doing terrifically. They've, we've had unprecedented levels of corporate profitability. But those profits are largely driven by efficiency improvement. They're coming because corporations are cutting costs, in many cases because they're eliminating workers. For the most part, the extraordinary profits are not coming because those businesses are selling more stuff. And yet, you know, looking forward, that approach is unsustainable. You can't forever have, have corporations becoming more and more profitable just by cutting costs. There's obviously a, a limit to that. Eventually, they've got to be able to sell more. And in order to sell more, there have got to be viable consumers out there. And those people have to have an income from somewhere. So you, you can see how that's potentially going to lead to a real problem in the future. So finally, the question then because what, what can we do all about this? And, and I think uh, fundamentally, we're going to face a decision, a choice. And uh, it's easy to imagine a very utopian outcome. You can imagine a future where no one has to do a dangerous job. No one has to do a job that they hate a, or an extraordinarily difficult job. Uh, we can imagine a future where machines and algorithms and smart systems take on all that work and that people have more time for their families, for leisure, for engaging in things that they find genuinely rewarding. But it's pretty clear that we're not going to have that kind of utopian outcome unless we solve the income distribution issue. You know, people are not going to have a great future if they don't have an income. Obviously, they, they need an income to survive. And as I just pointed out, they also need an income so that they can act as consumers and continue to drive prosperity. So I think in the long run, we probably are going to have to look at a genuinely radical scenario, something that decouples income from traditional jobs. And I think that the best way to do that is some kind of a guaranteed basic income so that everyone in our society will have access to some sort of a livable income, even if they are not able to find a, a traditional job. And that's something that is politically almost unthinkable right now. But I think that nonetheless, as this trend unfolds, uh, it's probably inevitable that we're going to have to move in that direction. So again, my point in, in talking about this is really to initiate a conversation. My hope is that people will think about this and talk about it. And as that conversation progresses, you know, hopefully we'll have some realistic solutions that will emerge from this.